Thank you for reminding me. Um, what I said was, um, there's no problem with that. You're organizing things very well. Um, I can hear and see that you're completely in control of what's going on. So it's, it's a great relief when you're doing a remote presentation. It's, uh, it's really nice to know that the person who's organizing at the other end is in control. Um, you, and I can see absolutely that you are. So um, it's great. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just be happy to start whenever you say. Um, yes, that's not, not an issue. And uh, so I'm happy to wait until five past or so or whatever you think is best. OK. Yes, sir. Thank you. Lovely. Participants, kindly switch off your cameras and mute your microphones, please. Thank you. So we have our principal also here. Uh, meanwhile, we can introduce one another, I think. Uh, ma'am, Vanda, ma'am. Hello. Uh, ma'am, you can um, switch on your camera so that sir can see you and you can talk to him. Yes, yes, sure, sure. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, or good morning, as it is here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have been uh, conducting international symposiums, so I say then good day, because uh, last symposium, of some people were from Japan, some from Brazil, some from USA, and some from UK. So, and uh, we had started early morning, so... It was uh, early morning, so good morning for Indians, but for the rest of the participants, it was good day only. So, absolutely good day, sir, and uh, <laughs> good. Uh, welcome to this session. And uh, I'm really thankful to you, sir, and we are highly obliged that you accepted our invitation. Uh, let all participants, again I am repeating, that the um, College is the college premier institute in the state of Goa, which was started okay, immediately after Goa's liberation from Pochi's colonial rule. So that was in 1961. 1962, immediately in the month of June, uh, college was started. So we are celebrating our 60 years of establishment. And to commemorate uh, the founders' uh, efforts taken by the founders, each department is organizing 
national or international uh, symposium or webinar okay one thing corona has done and that is it has uh, taught us to get connected uh, globally that is the plus point of uh, covid 19 and uh, we have been conducting now many webinars numerous i think there are more than 45 uh, symposiums and conferences international even including some of them with nobel laureates that we have conducted uh, for last uh, now one and half year so this has been uh, very uh, i would say challenging and opportunity okay to get connected across the globe and uh, i am really appreciating the efforts taken by department of psychology it was a very fruitful now today uh, yours is the last session sir uh, but it was it is a very fruitful uh, i would say uh, webinar because yesterday there were nearly very close to 1000 people viewed the full sessions so uh, the viewers are about more than very close to 900 plus 100 on online so i would say that uh, when we conduct webinars we get better exposure and those people who are interest really interested can join okay and uh, see it even when they have some uh, they can find that time like particular time so so <coughs> so again i i really thank you okay appreciate that you have accepted our uh, invitation and from all of us from dempe college a uh, warm welcome to you sir uh, i think uh, it's already uh, 2:30 here uh, um, cindy we can start professor wilson lecture yes ma'am yeah when our uh, the of we will be eager to have you in person in goa sir our college is located just on the banks of river and uh, we have a nice mirama across you can enjoy in the college and we will enjoy your lecture in person sir thanks a lot thank you so very much principal um uh, i i know the college of course well um because as you know uh i live in goa for normally for half of every year and work with one of your partner organizations sangath um i know you had uh dr abhijit nadkani talking this morning yeah. um and uh abhi uh, abhijit and i work very closely together we we founded and both run right. the addictions research group so uh uh i i have spoken uh, live uh, it, in your college before and i very much look forward to doing that again okay. i just regret that i'm not able to do it now in person um but hu huge congratulations for your 60 years um of uh, of running such a successful college um and uh, as you say the the reach of these um online facilities that we now have developed um is really quite amazing um and uh, there have been very few positives about covid but one of the positives certainly is how people realize that they can be in touch with other people across the world and they don't need to do that in a physical way they can do it in a in a, a physically distanced um but still very social way as we're doing today so um thank you so much for those kind words Thanks a lot, sir. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, since it is two thirty now, we shall begin with the session. Okay. Um, in that case, I will go back to, as I say, sharing my screen, which I know you can see up there. But uh, once I move on to actually seeing it, I then can't see anything else. So, and finish talking. Um, uh, if you need to interrupt me, you'll have to please come in verbally and do so. Um, yes. The, the, my plan is to speak for um, about uh, 45 minutes, um, maybe a bit less than that, 
um, and then to throw open the uh, to, uh, questions and, and I hope discussion, not solely questions to me, but also people discussing with each other some of the ideas that I'm raising. Let me uh, put my reading glasses back on and <laughs> move uh, to the screen that I can see. Uh, you to do, sir. Is there? Yeah. Sorry. So just a second. Uh, we want to introduce you to the audience. Oh, of course. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Thank you. Good day, sir. Uh, good day, Professor Rinda Borkar, Principal of our college, Professor Richard Bellman, the resource person for this session, participants and colleagues. I, Dr. Cindy De Silva, welcome you all to the fourth session of the second day international webinar on fostering optimal development and well-being in children and adolescents organized by the Department of Psychology, the city's Dempe College of Arts and Science, Miramar, Goa, India. Before we begin with the session, I kindly request all the participants to switch off their cameras and mute their microphones during the session. If any questions or queries, please do post in the chat box when the floor is open for questions at the end of the session. Feedback link will be posted in both Google Meet, chat box, and YouTube live chat section at the end of the session. And please note, participants will receive the e-certificates on submission of all four feedback forms. Once again, on behalf of Department of Psychology, the city's Tempe College of Arts and Science, Miramar, Goa, I warmly welcome you all. Good mental health is important for helping children and young people to develop and thrive. Promoting optimal development in a child, child works best if approached with flexibility, keeping the individual's child age temperament, developmental stage, and learning style in mind. As the foundation for a healthy body and mind is laid in early childhood, parents, teachers, and caregivers can help children achieve optimal well-being by providing a healthy and a protective environment. As this webinar aims to provide a platform for understanding and developing insights about how to create a nurturing environment to foster optimal development and well-being in children and adolescents, Today we have with us Professor Richard Wellman, resource person, who will help us understand what makes us makes a protective environment for a child's and adolescent's optimal development. I now request Professor Rinda Borkar, principal of DCT's Tempe College of Arts and Science, Miramar Goa, to welcome our resource person, Professor Richard Wellman. Ma'am, over to you. Yes, uh, welcome again, sir. Okay, formally, I, as the principal of Dempe College of Arts and Science, I formally welcome Professor Richard Wellman from uh, University of Bath. It is uh, really we are all uh, we are privileged to have you amongst us for with for the last session of this two-day webinar, and uh, I think definitely many people were benefited out of this webinar. I congratulate all. The, uh, the, the staff from Department of Psychology and especially Dr. Mukta Karmadi for uh, organizing very well this webinar. Welcome again, sir, and I request you to start. Thank you, ma'am. Before we begin with our session, I would like to introduce our resource person for today, Professor Richard Bellman. Professor Richard Belvin is an Emeritus Professor of Mental Health Research, University of Bath, United Kingdom, and a practicing clinical psychologist. He is the co-director, Addiction Research Group, and Senior Research Fellow at Sangat Community Health NGO in Goa, India. He is also a treasurer and founder trustee, Addiction and the Family International Network, which works with policymakers, practitioners, and researchers interested in promoting work related to family members, who are affected by a loved one's addiction problem. He is a leading author on substance misuse with a specific interest in the impact of the substance misuse on other family members, including children. He has more than 300 publications to his credit, including 50 books, more than 180 published referred academic papers, scholarly chapters, and more than 25 major reports. He has worked in the addiction and mental health fields in the United Kingdom for over 40 years and internationally for the past 25 years, 
on both research and policy development with many international bodies like European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addictions and government and research organizations in Australia, Hong Kong, India, Italy, Mexico, New Zealand and other countries. He has led and managed many projects and organizations over his career. He was a member of the 15-person scientific committee of the European Monitoring Center on Drugs and Drug Addiction for six years, that is from 2008 to 2013. He has also developed theory and practice in relation to resilience in children who have lived within problem families and in relation to adults because of the stress strain information coping support model and of the five-step method which are used extensively with understanding and helping affected family members. His current projects include in India developing and researching new ways of delivering psychological interventions to people and their families with mental health problems including both community lay health workers and new technologies to deliver these services. His projects in other countries include implementing interventions to help affected family members with the addiction problems of a close relative, include New Zealand, Austra Australia, India, Netherlands, Ireland, and Italy. So we are really honored to have you with us today. Professor Wellman, I now request you to kindly start the session that everyone has been eagerly waiting for. Sir, over to you. Thank you for those lovely words, um, and thank you for such a warm welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here talking to you all. And as I said right at the beginning, um, I'm only sorry that I can't be here physically. Um, but uh, I'm hoping to come to Goa uh, in the next uh, month or six weeks. Um, and if all goes well, I will be, and then I'll be able to visit Dempe College in person. But for the moment, I'm afraid it's just from England. So I've been asked to talk about creating and nurturing a protective environment uh, for the optimal development of children and adolescents. Um, and I really want to ask and answer three questions today. I want to ask what makes a protective environment for children and adolescents? And then I want to ask what the risk factors are, which we need to guard against, which might reduce the chances of that environment being protective. And also, and more importantly, what the protective factors are which produce such a nurturing environment and which encourage resilience. How do we encourage resilience in our children? So if we take the first question, what makes a protective environment for children and adolescents? I think the first thing to emphasize is that a protective environment for our children is not an over cosseted environment. It's vital that we do not over protect our children that we don't create a completely risk-free environment, never allowing our children to develop the skills that they will need so that they can overcome adversity. Uh, if children have no learning about what to do in slightly challenging situations, then they never learn those skills. So one of the things in our uh, wish, our attempt to create environments that are protective um, one of the things we need to avoid is making them so protected that the child never learns some of the necessary skills. Instead, I'm arguing that we need to create an environment that creates and develops resilience in our children. That is, it will enable them to face adversity, which we all face in our lives at various points, and overcome that adversity and grow stronger from having overcome it. So that's the aim. What we're aiming to do is to create environments which allow our children to be resilient, to be strong enough to be able to deal with adversity when it happens and to successfully move on from there. So how do we do that? How do we create an environment which makes our children resilient? Well, actually, although what I'm going to say is a lot more complicated later, but actually it's very simple. An environment which creates resilience is one where adolescents can experience attachment and security while still experiencing challenge. So that's, that's, that's the challenge for us as parents. Um, the challenge for us as people who try to fashion communities is how do we create an, an environment where children can experience attachment and security on the one hand, but still experiencing challenge on the other with our assistance to get through those challenges. So how do we create an Sorry, wrong 
So a child who feels attached and feels secure is much more likely to be resilient to whatever bad things happen to them in life. And a child who experiences unpredictability, insecurity, exclusion, and isolation is much more at risk of not being resilient. So those, in a sense, are the take-home messages. I'm going to go on in much more detail to say what we need to do. But in, those are the take-home messages. We need to enable our children to feel attached and secure. We need to not have our children feel that life is unpredictable, insecure, that they feel excluded, they feel isolated. So what leads to a child and an adolescent being resilient? Well, two things. First, we need to think about how we reduce risk factors. The more risk factors there are, the more difficult the child will find it to be resilient. And we need to develop more protective factors, as these are the factors that create resilience and mean that the children will find it easier to overcome adversity. So overall, we need to work to create environments which develop attachment and security while still experiencing challenge, as attachment and security are the key elements that lead to resilience. So I've mentioned that there are risk factors and protective factors. I'm going to spend more time talking about the protective factors, but I thought I would just deal with some of the risk factors first. We know from lots of research what all the main risk factors are which create a lack of resilience and a lack of attachment and security. And there are three sets of risk factors. There are factors related to the family, and these are, um, I contend, but also research backs this up very strongly, these are the most important set of risk factors, but also there are individual factors and community factors. So what are these family factors which are risky, to, or which create a risky environment for children to grow up in? Well, they are family disharmony, and within that, family aggression, family violence, parental conflict, parental separation and loss, inconsistent and ambivalent parenting, financial insecurity, emotional insecurity. So all of these things make it much more risky, make the environment much more risky for children to grow up in. Um, now, obviously, we can never create environments which are completely harmonious, where there's harmony, where no one is ever angry or aggressive with each other. We can create environments where there is no violence. Um, it's very unlikely we'll create environments where parents are never in conflict. We have to work hard to ensure we don't create environments where parents separate from each other. And if parents do separate from each other, we have to work hard to ensure that children don't lose contact with one or other of the parents. Where the we work hard to be consistent and not inconsistent um, and ambivalent about what we're saying. And I'll say much more about, about that under uh, protective factors. We can never ensure financial security, but we need to try and ensure that if there is financial insecurity, we don't draw our children into being as insecure as we may about our financial insecurity. So there's an old adage which many people used to use in certainly in England uh, many years ago when I was a child and before that where people would say um, parents shouldn't uh, argue and shouldn't uh, raise in, uh, children was the adage that people used to give. Now that's in some ways got out of fashion but it was a very very good idea um, children don't need to be drawn into parents' worries. Children need to feel security, not uh, completely blindly, but they need to feel security. So many children in families with one or and family violence and so on, many of these children can experience very negative childhoods. They can experience violence and abuse and living with fear. They can experience inconsistency from one or both parents. They can experience having to adopt responsible or parenting roles at an early age, having to look after their parents, having to look after many, many younger siblings and so on and so forth. They have to deal often with denial from other members of the family, distortion, secrecy, having problems related to attachment and separation and loss, having to deal with disturbed family functioning, the disturbed family functioning I've just been talking about, and conflict and breakdown, 
And often they will experience having role reversal, that is having, as I said, looking after your parents as opposed to your parents looking after you, role confusion, um, both related to their parents and to themselves. Many of these children who, have, who grow up in very risky environments subsequently demonstrate many negative effects of these experiences. So children who grow up in very risky environments have higher levels of behavior disturbance, more antisocial behavior or conduct disorder, they can show emotional difficulties, they can have school problems both academic and behavioral, um, they get older very quickly, they show what is, is uh, termed in the literature precocious maturity, they're acting as if they're much older than they are, and they can have a much more difficult transition from childhood through adolescence, all compared to children who've not had such a risky upbringing. So we know that these risk factors are particularly important that we try and reduce. And there are also longer term impacts as well. These children who grow up in very risky environments are much more likely themselves to develop problems with gambling or substance misuse, even if as children they were badly affected by their parents' um, gambling or substance abuse problems. They're often linked to earlier onset of use of gambling or drinking or taking drugs. They're at greater risk of developing problems in other areas of their life as adults. So having a large number of risk factors in a child and adolescent's upbringing can be really quite bad news for children. And there are also another set of family factors which revolve around the problems that parents and families can have, parental alcohol problems, parental or family unemployment, uh, family poverty, all these can be very real problems. But I want to emphasize that in these situations, it's not the specific issue as such, for example, poverty or aren't having an alcohol problem. It's not the specific issue which can cause the uncertainty or the insecurity. It's how these problems are dealt with by parents. So certainly, if you have a parent with an alcohol or a drug or a gambling problem, if you grow up in great poverty, um, uh, and if you grow up with uh, your, your main caregiver being unemployed when they need to be employed, all of these effects by having effects on the family functioning that I mentioned earlier, the things to do with family disharmony, with aggression, with violence, violence with parental separation, not because of the problem per se. So as I say here, there are families where a father has an alcohol problem or the parents are unemployed or where there is poverty, but as long as these things do not lead to disharmony or violence or conflict or inconsistency in parenting, then these very real issues do not need to lead to a reduction in resilience. So the risk factors are not the alcohol, the drug, the gambling problems, the unemployment, the poverty, the risk factors are how those impact on the family and the family functioning. So I said that the family risk factors are the most important, but that there are other risk factors as well. There are individual factors and there are community factors. So individual factors. So if we have a child who is not interested in anything. It doesn't really matter what they might have an interest in, in general, um, but not having an interest or a hobby or a sport or an activity into which the child can become involved is a risk factor. And one of the things we need to do as parents is thinking how we can develop interests in our children so that they do have things which they can become involved in. Another individual risk factor is having few or no experiences of success. Um, so again, it's very important as parents that we think about how we can develop a situation, develop an environment in which our children can experience, uh, have experiences of success rather than failure. A big risk factor is children having very few self-control skills. Um, self-control skills are things which children learn very early. Um, and uh, there's been very interesting research showing that children at a very young age of two or three who, experience, who, who demonstrate having very little self-control, um, the, 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 that characteristic carries on for a long time and has negative relationships with lots of other outcomes when those children grow up into older children and younger adolescents. Another individual risk factor is being 
is having a great deal of uncertainty and insecurity, and also children who are very shy are uh, uh, more at risk um, than children who are not very shy. Now, lots of those things we can't do very much about. We can't do very much about shyness. Um, uh, we can't do. We can do some things about self-control skills, but not. Not a lot, because as I say, these things are engendered very, very early. But there are things that we can do in terms of these individual factors about trying to develop interests, about giving experiences of success and ensuring that somebody does not grow up with uncertainty and insecurity. The third set of factors, which are uh, risk factors for, for the environment for children, are community factors. And basically, there are three or four things here. Having weak bonds with a local community, um, having a low level of community involvement, which could include involvement with one's religious community as well or instead of uh, other areas of the community, having an unsuccessful school experience and being socially isolated. All of these are community level factors which are very important in that they create environments which are which put the child more at risk of not developing resilience so how do we reduce these risk factors well as parents we need to try and ensure that we don't create a family environment which contains a lot of these risk factors so for the family ones we need to work to reduce family disharmony and within this to stop family aggression to banish family violence, to reduce parental conflict, to fight against parental separation and ensure that if there is parental separation, we fight against parental loss, um, to banish inconsistent and ambivalent parenting and to not allow financial insecurity to affect our children. Now, these may sound uh, very difficult things to do, but they're all things which we as parents can do and are within our power to do. And we need to work on our children's interactions with the community so they do not have weak bonds with the local community. They don't have a low level of community involvement. They don't have an unsuccessful school experience and they're not socially isolated. And we need to work sensitively on the individual factors. We need to gently encourage the development of an interest or a hobby or an activity into which the child can become involved. I say gently because I think parental pressure can equally have a negative impact and telling children off because they're not developing an interest uh, can have very negative, uh, a ne negative impact. So what we're trying to do is not off, but what we're trying to do is gently encourage something which we think will be very helpful for the child. We try and create situations where the child can have an experience of success. We try and encourage control skills. We try to help with their shyness or their uncertainty or their insecurity. My message here is that even with these risk factors, there are lots of things we can do to mitigate against them and to ensure these risk factors do not have a large negative impact on our children's lives. I said I wanted to spend more time on the protective factors um, and let me start on them. What are are these protective factors which produce a nurturing environment and which encourage resilience? Well, we know that there are some very clear protective factors, factors which, if they're there, are much more likely to mean that children will not develop problems as children or as adults, even if they or their families meet adversity as they grow up, as everybody is going to. So we need to provide interventions, we need to intervene ourselves as family members, and we need in society to provide interventions which create these protective factors, either from the parent or parents or from other people. Things don't only have to come from parents. So what are these protective factors? Well, again, they can be usefully divided into the same three categories as the risk factors. So there are family protective factors, there are individual protective factors, and there are community protective factors. So again, let me go through them section by section. And let's look at these family protective factors. There are a lot of family protective factors. Uh, I certainly can't fit them all on one overhead. So I'm going to be going through two or three of these, um, saying a word or two about each of these protective factors. Well, the first thing is the absence of all the risk factors that I was, the family risk factors that I was talking about. So having a harmonious family environment is one of the most 
protective things that can happen to a child. And as I said, that doesn't mean that you have to have a perfect family where uh, the parents have a perfect relationship. Nobody ever has a cross word. Nobody ever argues. Of course not. It's trying to get the balance right and trying to ensure that that uh, if there are conflicts, those are not played out in front of the children and children are not used as part of those conflicts. Of all the protective factors, the next one or two are probably the most important. The presence of a stable adult figure. One of the things that creates attachment and security is having a stable adult figure. Um, and that relates to the second one, a close positive bond with at least one adult who's in a caring role. That is desperately important for children. Um, it's one of the most important things which creates resilience and one of the most important risk factors if a child does not have at least one close positive bond with an adult in a caring role with them. There's not at least one stable adult figure in their lives. That is often apparent and probably it's best if it's apparent, but it doesn't have to be apparent. It can be um, a very close grandparent. It can be an uncle or an aunt. Uh, it can even be a very important school teacher um, and so on and so forth. Um, th there are problems the more distant the person is from the family um, because you can't guarantee that that person will be there for the length of time that is needed um, for the child to feel this, this uh, security by knowing that there is somebody in their lives for a very long time who really cares for them. Um, but it can be done by somebody outside the family. So those um, having a harmonious family environment, the presence of a stable adult figure and having close positive bonds with at least one adult in a caring role are the most important family related protective factors that we know of uh, to help children grow up to be resilient. But there are many more. Affection being shown within the wider family is very important. Again, that creates this sense of stability and harmony for the child and of being wanted and of other people being wanted. A good support network within the wider family, having people within the wider family that children feel they can go and talk to or play with or spend time with. Spending significant time together as a family. There was some very interesting research that came out of the United States a few years ago, uh, which looked at how often the family got together for collective family meals. Um, so did they meet up together in the evening when the children were back from school and the parents were back from work? Did they have a meal together? Um, and this is in the context, obviously, of a very different environment to lots of Goa. Um, this is in the United States where uh, there's a lot more uh, family uh, dissolution, um, where people are often doing things working late in the evenings, uh, children doing lots of things out of the home and so on. But they were looking in that context, how often do the family get together and have a meal together. Um, and that's re the relationship between that and the child developing problems as adolescents. And they found a very, very clear um, uh, gradient that the more frequently the fa family got together and had a meal together, the less likely the child was to be developing problems um, when they reached adolescence. Um, and they found that there was a minimum of three or four times, uh, three or four evenings a week where the family got together, any less than that, and whether it was once or twice a week was immaterial. But if they had three or four, then that has significant effect on whether the children would go on to develop problems. And if they had more than that, the more they had, five meals a week together, six meals a week together, seven meals a week together, the more frequently they ate together as a family, the more likely it was that the child would not develop problems later in adolescence. Now, it's important to realize that the meal is probably not that important. Um, you don't, won't suddenly take children who are developing problems and say all their problems will be over because we'll get the family to sit together for an hour every evening and have a meal together. But I think the spending time together, having family meals together is a proxy for what was going on in those families where the parents and the family were making a very clear statement about the support network that they were offering for each other they were making a clear statement about wanting to spend time together as a family and it's those things I think which the family meal is a proxy for. Okay so there are more protective factors. The characteristics and positive 
care style of parents is a really important protective factor. And by that, I mean a balance between two important dimensions. One is the care dimension and one is the control dimension. So care includes parental support, warmth, nurturance, attachment, acceptance, cohesion, love, and so on and so forth. You can see um, affection, all of those things are on the care domain. And control includes parental discipline, punishment, supervision, and so on. So if you think about that as a, as a matrix where people can have more or less care or more or less control, you can see four styles of parenting um, where you can think about uh, a style of parenting where there's a, there's a great deal of care and a great deal of control um, you can have a style of parenting where there is a great deal of care, but no control at all. And similarly, on the other side, a great deal of control um, uh, and, and a great deal of care and a great deal of a very little control. Um, and what is important is that uh, parental style, which is very high on the care dimension and relatively high on the control dimension is the optimal form of parenting which creates resilience in children. So you have um, some clear parental discipline, supervision and so on, um, but you also have a lot of warmth, attachment, nurturance and so on. Um, parents often feel that if they want to provide a good environment for children, they should only concentrate on the care side, or other parents think they should only concentrate on the control side. But the absolute best style of parenting is one where there's a balance between the two. Another very important protective factor are the utilization of rules and consequences um, and experience strong parental supervision or monitoring of behavior related to those rules. Um, so having rules in the household are very important for children when they're growing up, they need to know what the boundaries are. Knowing that there are consequences for breaking those boundaries are important. Experiencing parents supervising those rules and monitoring their behavior are also very important. I mentioned at the end of the, the previous uh, bullet point, ESPA, European School Programme on Alcohol and Drugs. And what they have done for many years now is that they um, do a very large survey of up to 35 European countries looking at 15-year-old children at school. And they ask them lots of questions about alcohol, drug use, and very uh, many other areas as well. And they are interested to see how many children are starting to use alcohol to uh, to take drugs of one sort or another and what relationship uh, that is they that those areas have with um, other areas in their family lives um, the most important question um, which determined whether or not children uh, were more likely or less likely in this is in a European context were more likely or less likely to having early involvement with alcohol or with cigarettes or with drug use was their children's answer to the question, how often do your parents know where you are at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night? Now, you may think that it would be very strange um, that parents did not know what, where their 15-year-old child was on a Saturday night, but obviously there's a wide range of parenting and parenting styles, uh, and lots and lots of parents have no idea where their children is at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. But what was found, um, a very strong relationship, was the more likely the child to say, my parent knows exactly where I am um, on 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, the less likely they were to be using alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. So parental monitoring parental supervision is a very important protective factor. Again, with a relatively light touch, not being heavy handed, but very important. Okay, yet more. Um, parental modeling of behaviors expected of or wished for from their children. This is really very, very important. Um, uh, that we're all familiar with uh, people, parents as well, who say, uh, do what I say, don't do what I do. Um, but actually what children observe is how their parents behave. Um, and 
one of the most important influences on children is parental behavior, not what parental tell their children what they ought to do. That is, comes over very strongly in things like alcohol and drug and gambling behavior. Um, it comes over very strongly in smoking behavior. Um, when children are growing up, if their parents smoke, children are often quite negative about their parents smoking and are often asking them to stop. They, they hear at school about how bad smoking is and they go home and they see their parents are smoking and they beg them to stop. Um, however, the most important predictor of whether someone is a smoker in their early 20s is whether or not one or other of their parents smoked. So what they saw modeled by their parents' behavior is one of the most important predictors of the child's later behavior. Okay, so parental modeling of how they want their children to be as opposed to simply telling them to behave in certain ways is terribly important as a protective factor. The child having family responsibilities, um, and again, parents supervising and monitoring those responsibilities, whatever those responsibilities might be, it might be to, to do the washing up, it might be to, um, to throw the, the, the garbage out um, uh, at the end of the day, it might be all sorts of things, um, but having some responsibilities that the child has in the family, um, it might be looking after younger siblings, it might be a whole range of things, but it's very important, uh, a very important protective factor is the child having family responsibilities, because again, that makes the child feel much more more engaged into a family. It, it makes them feel much more that there are functions in the family. Um, the family works as a, as, a, as a network and they have an important part in that network. And then another protective factor is the family observing traditions and rituals, and they could be cultural, they could be religious, they could be family rituals, uh, they could be how children, uh, how the family uh, celebrates Christmas, or how it celebrates an important Hindu festival, the religion's immaterial. Um, it could be how the family celebrates birthdays. There will be traditions and rituals within the family, um, and it's the family observing those and handing down the traditions which are so important. Okay, so those are all the family protective factors. I said that there were a lot, and there are. So there are lots of things that we can do in our families uh, in order to make a protective environment, which means that our child is much more likely to grow up as a resilient young person. There are also individual factors. And what, some of these are, are the uh, converse of some of the risk factors earlier. So having a hobby or a talent or engagement in activities or interests, it could be sport, singing, dancing, writing, drama, painting, anything in fact, provide an of success on the one hand, or approbation from others for the child's efforts. I'm not saying that every child needs to be a greatly talented sports person, singer, dancer, drama person. I'm not talking about the level of talent they have. I'm talking about them having an interest which makes them want to go and do whatever that interest is and getting some experience of success from it or at least some experience of approbation from others for trying hard at that thing. So joining a, a, a group of people doing something can be very, very uh, important and is a very important protective factor. As I've said, having self-monitoring skills and self-control is very important. It's a very important thing for children to learn. I've said already that that's something which comes naturally, maybe genetically modified um, very early. But nevertheless, uh, we should never think that genetic things are entirely controlling. Um, they, they give a, a starting point for something, but children can learn self-monitoring skills and they can learn self-control. Um, another very important protective factor is actually having religion or faith in God. Um, now, that's an interesting one. There are very many people in our society across the world now for whom religion and faith is not important. Um, and I'm certainly not arguing that everybody needs to regain um, uh, their faith in God or, or have an active participation within religion. However, what we know from a lot of research is that those children who do grow up in a household where there is religion or faith in God are more likely to be protected than those children who do not. And then I've got three others um, which I've 
put in less a large uh, a font here. Um, and that's basically because these are things that we can do very little about. They are protective factors, um, but these are things which are much more innate. So a sense of humor, um, it's, if anybody's ever tried to explain jokes to somebody else, you know that um, it's very difficult to teach a sense of humor. Um, intellectual capacity, uh, basically the brighter a child is, the more likely they are to be resilient. That's a huge overstatement, but nevertheless, um, there is a relationship between intellectual capacity and resilience. And having an easy temperament, an easy disposition, not being greatly upset by things, not being pushed off course. Now, um, many people might think that the, that, that is a learnt character characteristic. Um, certainly my experience um, from having children myself and grandchildren myself and observing a lot of other children is actually the temperament that children um, come out with when they're born seems to be relatively settled very easily, um, very early. Um, so I'm not sure how much you can you can modify that. Nevertheless, if you're lucky enough to have a child with an easy temperament and easy disposition, they're more likely to be resilient than one who is very brittle. Okay, so a number of individual protective. Um, and then there are finally a range of community protective factors. Now, again, these are the same as the individual factors. Engagement in outside activities, um, outside interests. Uh, but so uh, here I'm looking at it from the other other way, the other point. The, the individual one is saying what we as parents can do to encourage our children to develop these interests. Here I'm thinking about what the community can do to ensure that there are such outside activities which our children can be involved in. Um, so developing sports groups, um, singing groups, dancing groups, writing groups, drama groups, painting groups, whatever it is, places where children can get involved. The one of the things that Goa does particularly well is having a range of festivals where people come together to create the most amazing uh, floats uh, which are taken ar around. And those floats um, often can be worked on by people across the community. Um, that's a, a lovely example of how there can be a community action which can actually be very protective for children to be involved in. As I said, anything that can provide an experience of success or approbation from others or of belonging, which is very, very important. The community needs to take responsibility for trying to develop successful school experiences. Um, it's not simply a matter of leaving that up to every school, but we as, a, as communities need to think about how we work with our schools so that the schools give children experiences which are positive rather than negative. Strong bonds with the local community, again, are very strong, a very important community protective factor. Strong community involvement, and as I've mentioned, strong bonds with a religious community as well. So, to return to the title of my talk, how do we create and nurture a protective environment for the optimal development of children and adolescents? Well, the answer is that there are lots of things that people can do. And by people, I mean parents, obviously, we as parents, other family members, teachers, members of the community, of every community. There are lots of things that all of us in those different, wearing those different hats, lots of things that all of us can do to help both reduce the risks to children and increase the protective factors for children. And both reducing risks and increasing protective factors increases the probability of our children being resilient. So now, that's me. Over to you. Questions, discussions, maybe a debate. Maybe people want to take issue with what I've said. Um, and uh, I'm very happy for that. So uh, over to you. Thank you, sir. Your session was truly insightful and enlightening. Um, on behalf of Psychology Department of DCT's Dembe College of uh, Arts and Science Miramar and participants present here, we extend our sincere gratitude to you for taking your time out and sharing with us your valuable insights. Thank you, sir, for a very informa informative session. We definitely have lots to take from today's session. I now request participants to please post their queries as the floor is open for discussion.
Okay, so, oh, it's gone. Where's that question gone? How do I? Right, okay, I've found it. Okay, how does, so thank you, Nandini um, Cardoso, for the question, how does faith and belief in God increase resilience? Um, it's a good question. Um, I think it does it in a number of ways. I think that um, for children to grow up within a religious, uh, within a community, within a family where religion and faith is important, gives them that sense of belonging that I mentioned earlier, um, or can encourage that sense of belonging, which I think is very helpful for uh, for many children and adolescents as they grow up. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, all religions have uh, quite clear moral codes built into them. And I think it's very protective for children to grow up um, with uh, with a knowledge of, of of what the clear moral code might be um uh, and to feel part of a community where that moral code is adopted so uh, th there's a concept in in some areas of, of psychology called religiosity which doesn't look at, at any particular faith but looks at how much people have some sort of, uh, of on the one hand have faith but also on the other hand uh, participate in going to church or temple or the mosque um, and do a range of other things um, which are related to religion, how often they pray, for example, and so on. And the higher they are on religiosity in general, the more likely those children are not to get involved in activities which might cause them uh, great problems down the line. So they're much less likely to get involved in criminality, in uh, use of alcohol or drugs or, or gambling or smoking early and any of those those things. So uh, it's it's a very it, it's it's interesting about what it is about religion and faith, which might be protective. Um, it, uh, yes, I, I could say more about that, but I'll stop at that point. <laughs> I hope that answers the question. Actually, while I'm waiting for other questions, I'll just say a little bit more about that. Um, I, I used to think that, uh, in general, religion was something which uh, human beings, uh, and I speak as somebody who's not a very religious person, so so I apologize if what I'm going to say might be um, uh, in any way upsetting for anyone. Uh, I don't mean it in that way, but I'll tell you about myself. Um, I used to think that religion was something which humankind invented uh, to explain things that they they couldn't uh, explain. Uh, they needed to invent God uh, in order to explain what they couldn't explain. And as more as science has moved on and we understand more and more, so the need for religion was less and less. So I, I, I understood that, that across the world, um, religiosity was reducing um, the number of people who actually go to church and whatever is reducing the number of people who say that they have a belief in God was reducing. Uh, and I saw that maybe as a sign that society was developing to uh, a, a state where it didn't need to have religion anymore. I've changed my view on that quite a lot, partly because of the research I just mentioned, um, uh, where I now am much less certain about that. I think that that um, uh, it used to be that people followed moral codes because they believed that God told them that they needed to follow those moral codes. So the, in, in the uh, Judeo-Christian um, uh, idea, there is you have the Ten Commandments and you know the very basic things, thou shalt not kill. Um, you do that because that is what God tells you to do. As society grows, uh, you, you don't need that anymore. People uh, follow those codes because they realize those codes are the right codes and they don't need to have a God standing over them telling them to behave in that way. I'm no longer sure that that's the case. I think that that uh, getting in, in, in the Western world where religion is much, much less um, uh, important than it used to be, I think getting Getting rid of religion has been something, or reducing the importance of religion, has been something that's had a very negative effect on society. And I think lots of uh, young people and older people grow up now uh, without that moral code. Um, I'm not saying everybody goes around killing themselves, killing other people. Um, but what I'm saying is that the, the, the range of moral codes that we have um, 
which we inherited from religious uh, ideas uh, without the the religion circling them seems to me they, they have much less value to society um, so I, I'm I, I think that maybe our move away from religion has been quite a negative has had negative impact on society okay so I see we have, some other... yes so we have two more questions yes uh, one question goes as when a child is burdened okay. with family responsibilities at a young age how it shapes his personality okay um, well I think again uh, it, it's difficult this because I've said on the one hand it's important that their child there are family responsibilities and on the other hand it's uh, I've said that that you mustn't uh, allow a child to take on too many family responsibilities particularly ones which are not age appropriate um, so uh, children who who are taking on looking at the, the, the role reversals of looking after their their parents or looking after too many children at too young an age and so on having to go out and earn money for the family all of those things can be a burden um, so sorry let me just move that back up so I can see this so I think, again, these things are about a balance. So it's very important that a child does have some responsibilities within the family. There are some tasks and activities which the child knows is theirs to do, uh, and the family is relying on to do that. But these don't have to be really, these you should not be extremely important and burdensome responsibilities. I think if you put too great a burden on a child, then they spend too much of their time worrying about um, other people in the family and their role within the family, and too little time um, enabling themselves to, to both enjoy themselves as children, but also to get the security that they need to have. Um, if, you, if, you put, if you overburden a child, then I think that leads to a lot of insecurity, um, and that's very unhelpful. So I think it then can shape personality in lots of ways. I think that you can cr shape a personality where the person becomes um, very over familiar with taking on too many responsibilities and that they can go through life then taking on more responsibilities than they should do and more responsibilities than maybe they need to. Um, and that can have a negative effect on them throughout their lives. Thank you. Right, moving on to the second question. Um, when a child feels safe at her uncle's place rather than her own house, it is appropriate to stay at the uncle's place rather than her parents' place. Um, I think that's a very good question. A lot depends on, on why the child does not feel safe um, at her parents' place. Um, I think safety is terribly important. Um, and I think, the as, I've, as I said, it's terribly important as a protective factor that the child has at least one adult um, in a caring role who they know really loves and cares for them. Um, in this situation, if that was the uncle, then it's really important that that relationship is, uh, is, is nurtured and maintained because that's going to be incredibly important as a protective factor for the child. But um, it would not be helpful if by the uncle saying, come and stay with me, that caused major uh, problems in the family. Uh, the child lost contact with her own parents. The uncle um, lost contact with the brother or sister who was the parent of that child and so on. So I think these things have to be done quite sensitively. Um, but in general, I think, think that it might be appropriate for uh, the child to be with the person who they, are, they feel most safe with. Um, that doesn't mean that the child should have carte blanche just to, to leave um, where they live and go and live with somebody else. I think obviously there are, there are, that, that has huge ramifications um, for, for the rest of the family. But certainly nurturing the relationship between the child and the uncle sounds very important. Okay, the next question. Can resilience be taught? If so, how can it be included in a school environment? What can be done at an institutional level to build resilience among students? Well, I think the first answer is yes, resilience can be taught. Um, uh, I think the most important thing that we do as, uh, as families and within schools um, is to teach resilience. I think that's even more important than teaching maths and, and, and um, Konkani and English and physics and all the other things that we might be talking, might be teaching in schools. Um, uh, but of course, we're not going to do that necessarily by sitting people down in classrooms. Um, 
as we might teach some of the other subjects. So I think resilience can be taught, but it's taught by developing exactly the factors, the protective factors that I have been talking about today. So I think you can uh, include resilience in a school environment by thinking about about those protective factors and thinking, okay, I want to make sure that every child has one, at least one person, one adult who they feel close with, one teacher who they can talk to. Um, uh, we will develop a, uh, a mentoring scheme so that every child has at least one person, one older child within the school. That's very, very good. So young children coming in have somebody older in the school who takes them under their wing and looks after them and knows that their responsibility is to help that person negotiate the first year or two of school. School. You could think of a cascading model where every child has responsibility for looking after a younger child as they come up. Um, and then when that younger child moves up to a certain age, they then take on the responsibility of looking after the new people coming in at a younger age. Um, I think teachers can take on a mentoring role um, uh, and can think about how to develop this security and attachment that they know these children need. I think that schools can think about activities um, in school um, or after school activities, such as clubs and societies and sporting things and so on. I think that schools can think in detail for each child, what is it that we could engender in this child, which would allow them to feel included within the school and part of the school um, and feel get a sense of security and stability from that, as opposed to what happens in all schools for some children, which is that children feel very, some children feel very excluded and feel that the school environment is not a happy one for them. So I think there are loads of things that we can do. And also, um, talking about at an institutional level, um, there's been some interesting research over the last few years about school-based prevention activities and how one can develop institutions, school institutions, which are much more uh, protective and positive environments for children. If anybody is interested, uh, Rifa Rodriguez, if you are interested in that, please send me an email uh, and I will look up some of the research and send you some papers about that. Thank you, sir. We have another question from a participant on how being shy could be an individual risk factor. It's because, um, and I say these are one of the things that it's very difficult to do something about. Um, so so I'm, I'm always hesitant about focusing on the risk factors which we can't do anything about as opposed to focusing on the risk factors which we can do something about. Um, but the problem with, with being shy is that children, a child who is shy is less likely to put themselves forward to join any of these community activities I've talked about. A child is less likely to um, find it easy to develop uh, pro-social relationships um, uh, where they can get uh, a lot of feelings of, of approbation and so on from other people. Obviously, it depends on the extent of the shyness. Um, so, so I think helping people realize, helping children who are shy realize that they can join groups that don't have to be right at the forefront. They don't have to always put themselves forward, but they can actually get some sense of positivity by being part of a group as opposed to uh, being a leader. Um, and those sorts of things can be very helpful. Sorry, let me have a quick look at what's going through. Um, so there's another question. How to explain about resilience to a child in preschool? I don't think you can explain about resilience. Um, I think that's something that we as adults need to be very clear about. But I don't think our job is to explain to children about how, the, how about being resilient. I think our job is to create conditions which create their resilience. Um, so I don't think it's it's a it's a concept. I don't think we need lots of children going around saying, "Oh, I'm going to be resilient. I know how to be resilient." I think we just have to create the conditions, which means that they are resilient. So I don't think we would explain it very much. I certainly don't think we'd explain it to preschool children. But I think we will do what we need to do is create environments when where children can be resilient. And I've explained today how we can do that. I just think we've missed um, uh, so we've missed. Uh, Mukta's question, are there variations with regard to factors and protective factors across different cultures? Um, so, I mean, the answer to that is yes, um, there are. Um, I mean, just to take the one example of religion, for example, I mean, a religion is um, much 
uh, more dominant, I think, uh, within Goa um, uh, than it is um, in within England. Um, to take a very simple uh, simple comparison there, um, so there are variations there in in, in those in that factor. Um, there are variations, I think, in the the ideas, the cultural ideas that people have about families um, and what the role of families are. So I'm uh, arguing that one of the, the important roles of a family is to provide stability and security um, and that there needs to be warmth and love and nurturing going on within the family. And I'm not suggesting that there are cultures where that's completely not agreed with, but I think that there are some cultures where um, uh, it's much more uh, it's much more clearly understood that the role of parents is about disciplining um, and uh, not about offering uh, warmth and nurturing and love and so on. So I think there are there are cultural variations with regards to both the risk factors and the protective factors. But nevertheless, I think the essential um, points that I'm making um, are cross-cultural. Uh, not simply, uh, not they don't simply come from any one culture. But again, you may want to disagree with me about that. Um, uh, Thank you, sir. We yeah. have another question. Can mm -hmm. examples, case studies, and making children discuss help in explaining explaining resilience to children? Yes, as I said, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time explaining resilience to children, but I do think we can discuss the the protective factors we don't have to use the concept of resilience but we can discuss both risk and protective factors for uh, our partner has said this uh, say in value education classes yes absolutely um we can uh we can give give examples we can use case studies we can get children to think about why it might be helpful um for children to uh to get involved in the community, why it might be unhelpful or risk factor if they're not involved in that, um, why it might be helpful for children to get involved in activities or, or, or uh, 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 having, having an interest as opposed to not doing that. So I think that could be very helpful um, because I think the more uh, everybody, including children, understand why they're doing something, the more successful they're going to be at doing it. So we have another question. How can the family contribute to develop resilience in children? Well, I, Asha, Menon, I, I've been spending most of the last hour talking about that. Uh, so I'm not sure I could say any more about that. I think the family contributes to developing resilience in children by reducing the family risk factors that I've talked about. Um, uh, and as you know, there are quite a few, particularly around disharmony and arguments and aggression and violence and conflict. Um, but more importantly, they can increase uh, resilience by the protective family factors that I talked about. And as I think I listed about 15 or 20 ways in which the family can contribute to developing resilience in children. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the care versus control um, matrix, um, the, 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 uh, the wide range of, of things that I mentioned. Um, and by the way, I'm very happy for my, to send a copy of my slides um, over to uh, the college and anybody who wants a copy is very welcome to have them. Um, so the, the, you have a long list there of potential family factors. Okay, so another question here. Um, uh, if a child has witnessed violence between parents or siblings or anyone for that matter, would this have an impact on the child? Would it also lead to mental health issues or behavioral changes? If yes, then how can it be handled? So the answer, is, unfortunately, is yes. Um, witnessing violence um, is a very negative experience for children, um, particularly witnessing violence between parents. Um, now, again, one has to talk about what you mean potentially by violence, um, particularly if you're talking about between siblings. So a child who's uh, a girl who children, um, and uh, when the fighting becomes violent, um, that it can be particularly upsetting for children. Uh, so I think it's a very, it, it's often very negative. There's a lot of research showing that children being exposed to violence, um, particularly in their family, particularly between their parents, um, is it, it can have large 
negative knock-on effects. So yes, the answer is it can have an impact on the child. It can, I'm not saying it will. You said, would it lead to mental health issues or behavioral changes? Well, I mean, with all these things, we're talking about probabilities here, and we're talking about how resilient the child is. So if we have a very resilient child, then no, it won't lead to mental health issues or to behavioral changes. But if we have a child with very low levels of resilience, then it's quite likely that seeing uh, violence between parents um, could lead to mental health problems or behavioral changes. Um, I've already said that parental modeling is one of the most important um, ways that children learn, one of the most important determinants of later parental, later child behavior when they become adolescent and adult. Um, so unfortunately, what we know is that there are huge continuities about violence. Children who grow up in households where there are, where there's a lot of violence are much more likely to be violent. Not everybody. Some people go in the opposite direction and absolutely abhor violence and don't go anywhere near it. But it's very similar to what I was saying about children being very anti-smoking when they're children, but then becoming smokers later. The modeling effect is very, very large. And so children who grow up in a envir violent environment will see violence. Um, they may be uh, appalled by the violence when they're growing up. They may be terrified. It may be horrible, etc., etc. But that is the way that they have been taught by their parents to resolve conflict. And therefore, when they get into conflict as adults, they are much more likely to demonstrate violence than people who've not grown up in such an environment. Um, so, um, yes, it can lead to mental health issues. It can lead to behavioral changes. Um, how can it be handled? It's very, di very difficult. Um, uh, basically, it can be handled by parents not being violent with each other um, and by reducing the chances of children seeing um, interpersonal violence um, and making, working on all the other protective factors to try and increase that child's resilience um, and probably making it explicit that violence is not a good way to solve problems. But uh, it's a very difficult area. OK, can we build resilience of a friend and give them a comfort space as a teenager? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, can we as friends help build the resilience in our friends? Um, uh, absolutely. Um, I've said that one of the most important um, protective factors is having uh, a close relationship, somebody else. I've said a close relationship for a child, a close relationship with an adult uh, in a caring role. And that is, is there's, there's nothing which is as important as that. But having cl close other relationships with friends um, is terribly important. And if, uh, if one can build a relationship with a friend um, and help them feel more secure and more stable, you are much more likely to make them feel much more resilient. The problem, as I said, when when you are, the, I said earlier, the further you move from the, the center of the family for thinking about who can provide this important protective role, um, the more problematic it is because of continuity. Um, so having a parent or a grandparent or an older sibling um, is someone who's likely to be around for a very long time. Um, and therefore, they can provide that continuity. If that uh, strong emotional contact is given by a teacher, well, that's great for as long as you're at school and as long as they're a teacher. But what happens if they retire? What happens if they move away? Um, if it's done by a professional, a doctor, a social worker, that's great. But then often those people also change their jobs and change their roles. Um, so they're not there for the long term. Friends are an interesting one. Um, friends can be there for a very long, long time. Many of you will have people who have been friends, your friends, since you were in primary school or maybe before that. Um, other people have no friends for a, a long time and they make new friendship groups when they move to new places. Um, and so if you take on this role as a uh, as, as the friend who is going to befriend your your, your uh, somebody else, a teenager, another teenager, and uh, offer yourself as the person who can provide help and stability and comfort, you're taking on a role which has a commitment with it um, for quite a long-term relationship. And with friends, you never know how long those relationships are going to last for.
So yes is the answer. Um, it is completely um, possible to build resilience for a friend and give them comfort space and so on. Um, but you've got to remember that there may be a long-term um, uh, commitment to that as well. Um, I can share my email ID. Um, uh, it, it will be easier. Um, I suppose I can put, well, um, perhaps somebody could put my email ID onto the chat so that anybody who wants it can take it. That would be very helpful. Uh, so let me see what, uh, okay, we've got lots of very nice thanks, but no more questions at the moment. <laughs> so we have another question. How, yes. How can we provide a nurturing environment for children coming from broken families? Ah, right. Well, uh, a number of ways. I, I, one of the things that I said about the parental separation and parental loss thing as a risk factor is that parental separation, a broken family, um, is something that is very common in some parts of the world, of the West, and becoming more common um, in even in in India. Um, one of the things we can do is to try and ensure that parental separation does not mean parental loss. Um, so that even if parents separate, uh, it's very clear that the child can spend with the other parent um, and does spend time with the other parent and, and maintains a strong loving relationship with both parents, even if those parents are not together as parents. So that's the, that's the, the first thing. The second thing is that I've said that what's vital for a child's security is there is at least one person, um, preferably a parent, who provides this long-term positive commitment. So if the family has split up, but the child is still living with one parent, then it, it, the research is relatively clear that although it is more difficult in separated families, um, if the single parent who is looking after uh, the, the family, looking after the children, manages to reduce the risk factors and increase the protective factors um, in the ways that I've explained, then the child needs not be any more damaged by the fact that they come from um, uh, a, a separated family as any other child might be. They can be just as resilient. Okay, so now we have the next stage down in another question, um, which is uh, how can we provide or make a child safe who stays in an orphanage. Um, so here's a child who has lost both parents um, and is in an institution. And I agree, it's, it's even more difficult. This is a situation where I think a teacher can provide um, the, the necessary support um, and uh, longer term commitment. Um, but I think you'd need to choose the teacher very carefully. And it would not, it's not purely the teacher's um, uh, choice. It's also the child will make some choices um, where uh, uh, as to uh, which teacher they are more attracted to, which teacher they're more likely to come up and talk to and so on. Um, but it's something which a teacher should only take on with, with some due thought and consideration. Um, because if a child is in an orphanage and doesn't have contact with any parent and doesn't have any other family, then the relationship that that child makes with you, the teacher, is going to be even more important than a relationship that any other child might be making with their teacher. And so it's important that you realize that you're taking on a big commitment. It's not something which you should take on and then lightly give up um, because that could be even more damaging to the child. You've got to understand that a child in an orphanage has had many experiences of loss, um, which we know are big risk factors. Um, they've had many experiences of insecurity and lack of attachment, which again, we know are very big risk factors. So if we want to develop resilience in a child um, who has had these very high risk factors associated with them, we have to really think about how we can up the protective factors to overcome that. Many children who grow up in orphanages um, grow up as being very resilient because, as I said, the nature of resilience is you're able to deal with adversity. Um, so uh, there's very few things which are ad as adverse as uh, growing up in 
in, in an orphanage, um, not having uh, the family, not having parents giving you love and attention and so on. Um, so that's a big adversity. And if children can overcome that adversity and uh, if there are enough protective factors in the rest of their environment or if their temperament is such that they can manage to deal with that adversity, then they can grow up to be very resilient. So I mean... Toxic positivity. Have you any idea what that means? <laughs> As I don't. Can someone tell me what toxic positivity is? Can someone tell me what toxic positivity is? Or should I take a guess? Um, I don't really know. I mean, yes. it could be. Oh, someone's Hello. going to say something. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, the, the question was asked by me. So oh. when I say toxic positivity, I meant that uh, so people have a tendency to enjoy the grief, or sometimes they 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 get into this you know uh, what you call happy uh, mood when they are in you know a grief situation, or you know, it's a very negative way of handling the situation. But still, yet they try to pretend as if it's a very positive situation. They're like facing the situation in the right way. Ah, so, I, I so see I what like you mean. Yes, <laughs> it's it's al almost like a full positivity. Um, so something so, something is 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 uh, they have very negative experiences, but they put on a happy face the whole time. Right. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Probably. Like, yes. Yes. Some more like this. Okay. So, I mean, uh, I think we're straying here into other areas of psychology. Um, uh, because I think that that one has to be thinking about why someone who is experiencing what everybody else would be seeing as being a very negative set of circumstances and very negative emotion is uh, portraying uh, in a very positive way. Um, and the whole point, I suppose, about you calling it toxic positivity is is there's an element of falsity. Um, you you think the person is being positive in an environment or in a set of circumstances where nobody really could be feeling positive, and yet they're 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 showing that they are. So that they're 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 separating out the the experiences they're having from the actual feelings that they're demonstrating that 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 they're they're having related to those experiences. So I think that that raises a lot of questions about why they are reacting in that way and what, whether or not they, they, that's helpful for them. In general, I don't feel that toxic positivity has any role in resilience. I think that, that resilience is about um, being able to deal with adversity um, in an appropriate way uh, and not allowing the adversity to overcome you. Um, so I think that's, that in a sense, the essence of, of, of resilience. It's dealing with adversity um, appropriately, but not allowing it to overcome you. Um, so I think that somebody who has adversity and deals with it in a very inappropriate way is not demonstrating resilience. Uh, and I don't think it's, it's something we should engender in people when we're trying to teach resilience, when we're trying to look at, at how people deal with adversity um, in, uh, in, in a, a, an appropriate way without allowing themselves to be overcome by it. Um, and by the way, although I said earlier, I don't think we should be trying to teach, um, to, to label uh, resilient at a very young age to children. I think when we're talking with people uh, later in, in the types of classes that people were talking about at school, I think we can be thinking about defining resilience in the way that I just have and having discussions with, with young people about how is it that, that uh, what, what are the categories they think people need in order to be able to deal with adversity in uh, an appropriate way, but not allow oneself to be overcome by it and to move on? How is it that people can become stronger through adversity rather than um, uh, allowing adversity to, to, to completely destroy the person that they are and what they're trying to achieve in life? So, yes, I don't think that... that uh, falsely being positive in negative circumstances is a particularly helpful uh, thing in resilience.
Ah, okay. Making yourself believe or telling someone that it's going to be all right, even if it's not optimistic overview. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, being unrealistic um, uh, in your view about what's happening is probably not helpful. Um, uh, I don't think that's particularly going to be related to to resilient. Um, uh, I think having a, a realistic understanding of what's happening in your world and in your environment and then working out how to deal with it is much more helpful than simply believing that everything's going to be all right um, uh, uh, you know, uh, without taking any action to make things all right. So if all of these things, yes, are, I see are related to what was meant by toxic positivity. Um, and no, I don't think it's particularly helpful. <laughs> Yes, a state of denial, as, as someone has said. I agree. Thank you, Professor Wellman, for an insightful and an informative session. Uh, I would request all the participants to kindly switch on your cameras so that we could have a small photograph. So please, could you uh, end the sharing of the presentation? I will do that. Thank you. There we are. I'm not sure how you're going to get 77 people, so. Thank you all. So before we close the session, a few um, announcements to be made. Dear participants, uh, please note that the feedback link will be posted in the chat box in both Google Meet as well as YouTube channel. Please provide us with your valuable feedback. Also, please subscribe to our uh, college YouTube channel and so that you can have access to all our sessions. The link will be also posted in the chat box. Yes, so I have the opportunity to propose a word of thanks. It is my privilege to propose a word the contribution of those who worked really hard to make this event possible. On behalf of the psychology department, DCD's Dempe College of Arts and Science, Mira Margoa, I extend my sincere gratitude to the Almighty for making this webinar a grand success. I would like to extend a hearty word of resource person, Professor Richard Bellman, who spared time from his busy schedule to conduct such an informative session. Sir, today we had an opportunity to hear your thoughts and how to create and nurture a protective environment for the optimal development of children and adolescents by reducing the risk factors and understanding the protective factors and build resilience. This will surely encourage us in creating a nurturing environment for the young individuals. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful session. While the parent My pleasure. Class while the parent in us makes us monitor what the young individuals should not indulge in, we avoid paying attention to the inner needs of these young minds, thus creating an unsupportive environment. I would like to thank Dr. Abhijit Nadkarni and his team, Ms. Soumya Singh and Dr. Urvita Bhatia, for providing us with the detailed information related to the factors leading to substance abuse and the preventive measures that can help in dealing with the problem, along with the statistical data, a really thought-provoking session. Thank you, sir. The session was an eye-opener to us. I must mention a deep sense of appreciation for Ms. Ashwini N.V., Founder Director of Mukta Foundation, for an informative session on recognizing, responding, and preventing child sexual abuse to create a safe society. The session kept us spellbound, and I'm sure a lot of us will reach out to those who are silently going through this horrendous abuse. Thank you, ma'am. Grateful to Dr. Nandita D'Souza and Ms. Alan D'Souza for giving an excellent coverage on understanding child and adolescent mental health and nurturing resilience in the pandemic times. 
Thank you for the excellent session. Once again, I would like to extend a big thanks to all the resource persons. Your efforts for making this event informative for all of us is truly commendable. A very special mention to our respected principal, Professor Rinda Borker, for being the cap catalyst who motivated us to do our best. With tens of appreciation, we thank you, ma'am, for inspiring us always. I also take this opportunity to thank the management of DCT's Dempe College of Arts and Science, Mira Margoa, for their unflinching support. A heartfelt thanks to Sri Bhushan Savekar, Director of Education Department, Government of Goa, Mr. Bridges Shirodkar, General Manager of Goa Education Development Corporation, principals, headmasters, and headmistress of the various institutions across Goa and India for helping us connect with teachers and counselors. The seminar would not have been possible without the technical assistance from our system administrator, Mr. Gaurang Bani. Thank you, Mr. Gaurang Bani, for your enormous support throughout. Very special thanks to Mr. Sneel Harmulkar, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science of Tempe College, for assisting, assisting us during the two-day webinar, and also our social media team and our faculty members for helping us reach out to a large number of audience. Last, but certainly not the least, I sincerely thank all the participants for making this event success. Your timely joining of the session helped us conduct the webinar flawlessly, and your active participation kept us motivating throughout. Thank you all. Once again, we thank you for being with us in these two days. It has remained a pronounced pleasure. Thank you very much, and wishing you all a very good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Hope to see you soon thank in Goa. And I, I hope to be there and to see you all soon <laughs> there as well. Thank you again, then. Thank okay, bye-bye. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.